You're listening to The State of Work, the podcast by Lano. The State of Work is about finding your place in the changing world of work as an individual or an organization. In each episode, we dive into some of the benefits and limitations we face when it comes to remote and flexible work. We discuss how we work, how we hire and manage people, and how we live in this increasingly global workplace. I'm your host, Maddie Duke, and my guest today is Stefan Paleos, a B2B writer and freelance coach who's passionate about the future of work. Stefan joins me on the state of work to share some best practices when it comes to the way businesses and freelancers work together. Freelancers are a highly beneficial resource for business, particularly during phases of growth or expansion, and there's a lot to learn about hiring and working with freelancers or independent contractors. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks so much for joining me on the State of Work today. It's really good to be speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Could you just quickly tell me where you're joining us from today? Absolutely. Uh, I am joining in from a small town called Windsor, Nova Scotia. It's about a town of 5,000 people around an hour away from Halifax, which is the capital city of the province. Awesome. And I understand you've just recently moved there from, is it Toronto that you were in? Yes, I was living in Toronto for seven years working in tech and freelancing, and now I am freelancing out in Nova Scotia. Awesome. Living the dream, the remote life. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, you mentioned that you're a freelancer, a freelance entrepreneur. Could you maybe expand mm-hmm. on that a little and tell us a bit more about yourself and, and what you're doing? Absolutely. So I started my business as a writer. Um, I got cornered at an event and a founder of a startup said, I love your writing. Can I pay you to write for me? And I said, absolutely, because I want money. Um, And that was back in 2017. So fast forward a few years to 2021. um, I'm now a full-time freelancer. I have a roster of startups and companies that want to think like startups. And I write content for them, um, blogs, landing pages, web pages, uh, research, etc. That's the one half of my business. And the other half is I actually coach other freelancers on how to grow their businesses. I do that specifically through my course, which is called the Freelance Sales Blueprint, where we cover everything from the psychology of sales, mindset, all the way to scripts and contracts and all of the nitty gritty. Um, so that's that's what I'm up to now. And uh, I'm running that business from Nova Scotia. My partner and I just bought a seven bedroom Victorian house that we are slowly converting into a freelancer, remote worker bed and breakfast where you can come Amazing. stay. Uh, we've got fiber internet. I'm recording from the office right now that we're actually turning into a co-working space. So that's going to be part three of the evolution it's coming soon. I can't put a date on that. That's fantastic. We actually interviewed um, someone who runs a sort of similar, like a co-working, co-living facility out here just outside Berlin in an earlier episode. Cool. Um, super exciting. What a huge project um, and exciting project to take on. I'm really mm-hmm. excited to maybe one day come and visit you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, when international travel isn't nearly a crime. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, with your your what you're doing and your experience, you're we're really excited to be speaking to you today um, and hearing your advice for freelancers and also um, how freelancers can be, you know, useful to businesses throughout various stages of growth. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe one of the overarching themes that I guess we'll cover is like the relationship between freelancers and the businesses that use their services. Mm-hmm. Do you have some kind of core philosophies that you have about how to maintain that uh, that functioning relationship as a freelancer with your clients? Absolutely. Um, so I try to operate my own business on two core principles. Um, one is interest and the other is caring. So first, I, I often do a quick vet of every person that either reaches out to me or before I reach out to anyone. And I just ask a simple question. Am I at all interested in what you do. Because if I'm not, I know that I'm not going to put my best foot forward or 
um, you're going to have to pay me a lot to motivate me to put my best foot forward. And that's not necessarily the best way to start a relationship with a freelancer because it, it kind of puts us on weird footing because I really do believe that the best freelancers can, are partners with their clients where it's not you give me work, I do it, you're my boss, I'm a freelancer. It's I'm an entrepreneur running my business, you're either an entrepreneur if you're the, the owner or you are an entrepreneurial employee trying to get things done. Um, how can we partner? How can we each play our role? So that's part one. Am I interested? And then part two, as I talk to someone, get on a sales call, get to know them or do a trial project with them, which I'm a big fan of doing is do I really care? Do, is it deeper than intellectual? Do I actually feel a connection with you? Do I feel that we have a friendly rapport or at the very least um, a high quality professional relationship, even if we're never going to be friends, which is totally fine. So those are my two big ones. Um, and then it, everything stems from there because if I'm interested, I'm going to give it my all. And if they match that energy that because they're actually interested in their work, that's amazing. If I care about them and I start thinking more strategically because as a partner, I care about what's happening in your business, not just what you're paying me to do. And that all steamrolls into a really high quality reciprocal client relationship where they're paying me to do work, but the, the relationship itself is more than that. Absolutely. I, I wanted to um, mention something that I saw in an article that you contributed to um, in Forbes recently. It was a quote that stood out to me, freelancers don't need onboarding, but they need a clear scope. And this to me really touches on what you've just said, because, you know, as you mentioned, it's a working relationship. It's professional relationship. You're not coming in there as an employee. You're building a professional relationship where you've each you're each bringing different expertise to the table and you may each operate and have a different working culture like your values as your own freelancer might be different to those that of the client and I know that some freelancers come across businesses that kind of want to go bring them into this onboarding process or kind of project their own cultural values and and make and try to kind of force the freelancer into that Mm -hmm. Could you like speak to that? Is that something that you've also observed? Yes. And and I, I'll say two things. So one, uh, I don't think any of that's ever done in malice. So I don't think anyone ever approaches a freelancer and is like, I'm going to screw you over by forcing <laughs> you into things. Um, I, I think that it's just because we have such a mindset sometimes that freelancers are nothing more than temporarily unemployed employees. Where yeah. you, you know, you must be an employee. You must want employment at some point and you must operate best in an employment situation. And that's not necessarily a conscious thought. So many managers are just used to doing that. They have an employee. They treat them like an employee. That makes sense. But when you have a freelancer, it's a different mindset. So when I have a client that pushes me on that kind of thing or, or tries to, I try my best to avoid it. Um, I usually take one of, of two routes. So first of all, to your comment about core values, I'm a pretty big believer that it's hard to be interested and care if you don't align somewhat to their core values. Um, so I try to find the common ground. And then when it comes to the literal uh, onboarding flow, if someone tries to treat me like an employee where they say, oh, you know, Stefan, it, you're, we have a complex working system here. You know, you need to really focus and like learn about our company in order for you to deliver value. I have a slightly different way of thinking that because I'm so used to employment that I don't fully understand freelancers. So I will say, uh, first off, all of my client relationships have a kickoff call because I, I firmly believe like, I don't know about your business. I do need to learn a little bit. But that kickoff call is focused on what I need to know in order to execute, not knowing the whole ecosystem of the business. So I will mm -hmm. look to my client and in so many words say, I need you to tell me exactly what I need to know in order to, in order to execute because you're paying me to execute. So let's align our actions to the financial incentive here because otherwise you're going to be paying me to just sit in meetings, which is sometimes an offer that they really want. And so I'll say, look, 
you have my hourly rate. If you needed me to sit in extra meetings, do you want me to sit in 15 hours of onboarding? Because at, at that rate, I will. But otherwise, can we find a better outcome? Yep. And that all boils down to something that I talk a lot, a lot about in a sales perspective, which is what outcome are we trying to achieve here? And will these actions get us there? So very often companies will hire freelancers because they need execution. They need someone to do something, whether that's a super specialized skill they don't want to hire full time for, whether that is um, a desperate need, but not a big enough need to justify a full time hire. Uh, or they just like working with this specific person. But either way, they need to accomplish something. If they keep, keep pushing, I'll say, do you mind if we try maybe not for this like first thing? And then if it is awful, I promise I will apologize. I will eat crow and I will sit in your onboarding. And that has never ended up happening. Uh, so that, that's my thought on that. I, I don't think it's ever done with malice, but I also think that if freelancers don't creatively push back, um, it makes your business unsustainable and it actually doesn't help the client anymore. So it, it's literally a value destroyer. It's it's not even though they're getting more from you and you're getting less. It's just yeah. everyone gets less. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, what that really says to me is that there's such a need for freelancers to know how to kind of manage up, you know, or manage, I don't know how you would describe it, but manage that relationship. But what about the business side? Like what can we say to our, our listeners who might be, employees of businesses that are kind of doing freelancer management um Mm -hmm. what what is it that they need to know like what it seems like there's this disconnect between what freelancers know about employees and the way the businesses operate um and then the the reverse absolutely because i've had this happen as well where my direct client uh contact knows exactly how to work with me but then the moment they say oh you know could you chat with this person and then it's like oh let's book a three hour meeting and like have a lunch break. I think there there are two types of people and then two things to do. So the types of people is, are you managing freelancers directly in your role as an employee or are you just an employee engaging with a freelancer on a project? Um, But then the on the freelancer side or rather uh, a company looking out to the freelancer, First, you want to know what you actually need to accomplish, um, or at least what direction you're heading in. And then you need to know what kind of freelancer you're dealing with, because there, there's kind of that scale of freelancer to consultant to, to think about, where mm-hmm. I describe it as, I'm not claiming this is the official definition, just how I understand it. A consultant will tell you what to do. A coach will teach you how to do it a freelancer will just execute on your behalf. You've got to understand what kind of freelancer you're dealing with. So I define my own work as very much in the freelance because I execute. I will actually write the content for you, not just teach you how to write. But I do a little bit of education as well because I'll explain why I do a certain thing or I'll explain a trend that I've seen with my other clients and something they might want to consider for their business. Um, And that's on the writing side. And then, of course, on the coaching side with my course, I am actively teaching people the methods that I've used to grow my business. So on the company managing freelancer side, if you're managing a freelancer, you need to know what you want and you need to know who you're dealing with. Because if you hire uh, an educator, consultant freelancer and then expect them to do everything, you're going to get a lot of strategic pushback because that person is going, well, my business is education not execution. So that's something to note. And if you're working, yeah, if you're interfacing with a freelancer, if you're an employee, and this has happened a ton, it's just, um, I think the best question you can ask is, what are they being paid to do? And I know that people don't like talking about money. And I know that there's an interesting tension, because freelancers will often make on an itemized basis significantly more than employees. Um, where an employee is salaried at whatever, a freelancer doing the same book of work would make a lot more. They also get no benefits, no pension, no help. No exactly. Help. And so when you're that employee, first ask, what are they being paid to do? Because realistically, if you reach out to a freelancer on your team about something that they aren't being paid to do, most people who are professionals and actually consider themselves, you know, freelance entrepreneurs doing this for real, um, 
are going to be courteous. They're, they're going to offer a couple ideas. Um, they may even hop on a call if they either charge an hourly rate for it or just as a courtesy. Uh, but you're not going to get very far. And, and that's because they're just not incentivized to do that. They don't have the same total benefits package and total comp package that you do in that incentivizes you as an employee to think more broadly. Absolutely. You've got some really good philosophies and like a really fantastic overview of, of how you kind of, of the, the framework that you operate within and how you approach things. It's really inspiring. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about when it makes sense for businesses to work with freelancers, particularly when we're looking at companies that are at different stages of growth. They might be expanding but not not yet ready to hire or expanding globally into new markets um, mm-hmm. and perhaps working with contractors remotely. Maybe what are some examples of when it makes sense for businesses to work with freelancers? Yeah. So there there are three areas that I found to be really beneficial for hiring freelancers. So one is this concept of microemployment. One is the idea of specialized execution. And then one is uh, different growth trajectories. So microemployment is the idea where you have a business need, an ongoing need, but it's not enough to justify a full-time hire. Or maybe strategically, you don't want a full-time hire for that role. So a freelancer is a great person. You have them on a retainer. They actually do attend some of those onboarding meetings, and they act almost like part-time employees. Um, I've had one client like that for my entire freelancing career. They were my first client. I just submitted something to them this morning before I got off this call with you. And they don't need me full time. I don't want to work full time for them, but we have an amazing relationship. Um, then we get to the specialized execution. So if you do need something that is either spot or even ongoing, but is specialized, um, it can often be way easier and way faster to just work with a freelancer. Um, so working with someone like me, for instance, as a writer, uh, I come into writing from the perspective of I've tried starting my own startup that failed. I've worked in a bunch of startups uh, of all sizes. So I understand the startup mentality. So if you are a startup that's trying to grow and you need content, I might be a lot faster than trying to hire a full-time content person. And it actually nets out to almost cheaper working with a freelancer in many cases than it would be to, you know, pay a hiring agency or that the internal resources to hire and then the onboarding and the laptop and the blah, blah, blah. Um, the third tier is kind of what I've come to call like phase two growth. So you talk about the early stuff where you're figuring it out. You're building the initial ecosystem. Um, then you have phase two where you've got to run the wheels, um, just get it going. And then phase three, maybe you need massive scale. And that's where maybe an agency might be a fit. Phase two is a great time to hire freelancers because freelancers are trained to execute. And if you think back to what I said earlier, of you really just need to know what you want. The moment you're able to go to a, an execution focused freelancer, someone like me that actually does the work and say, this is what I want. Can you do it? And then they say yes, and then you do a trial project, and then you're off to the races. That is an incredible time saver. And I've had this as feedback from clients, but then also myself hiring other freelancers for different parts of my business. The the mental bliss of knowing that a piece of work is just going to be delivered um, is really good. Um, and I've had that feedback from clients where they're like, the real value here wasn't just the blog post you wrote. That's great. Thank you. But it was that I didn't have to think about it. I sent you an email about what I wanted and then a blog post happened so that I could focus on other things, knowing that that piece was going to be coming in and I could plug it in. Um, That's a valuable time to work with freelancers. So those are the three. Um, The the fourth or kind of like three A is if you aren't sure what you need, then a freelance consultant who's going to help you sort through the problem could be really valuable. Um, you just want to be aware of costs and budget at that time because paying a professional to help you experiment can get very expensive. Yeah. And what do you think about like if a company is like, well, when's the right time to fill a position instead of going with a freelancer? Do you think that there's a point in time that that, that, that becomes a clear decision or do you think it's a separate thing? 
I think there's a certain amount of uh, company values to that question. So I know a couple entrepreneurs that just really prefer full-time employees. So they will hire one the moment they think they can, and maybe even a moment before. Um, then there are others that prefer the leaner team. So working with freelancers on that more like micro employment structure works really well for them. Um, I don't have a specific rule of thumb, but the gradient that I've seen is when you have too many extra contextual questions. So it's not just, uh, you know, we need 50 blogs for our new launch. It's we need someone to plan how the launch fits into other pieces. So uh, when it's no longer either really neatly, nicely boxed, that's the ideal for a freelancer because you can hand a freelancer that box and they run with it. Um, it's when you have to start connecting across silos that's where employees are actually incredibly valuable to play that quarterback role, to play that jockey role, to use a couple sports references, even though I don't watch either sport, but I digress. <laughs> um, it, employees are incredibly valuable for connecting the dots. Freelancers are incredibly valuable for providing the dots or, you know, coloring them in, in order to connect with other things. So that's, uh, that's the best mental framework I've seen of I know like the client projects I've had that haven't gone well have often been ones where the real project was a connector project versus an execution project. And that's not saying you can't hire a, a freelancer to do that or a consultant to help you do that. But again, that gets really, really expensive. Mm. And if you have the budget and you want to speed it up, that can be very valuable. Sometimes, sometimes it's not really a question of dollars. It's a question of time. So think about that for your business. But generally speaking, I've seen that employees are amazing dot connectors and freelancers are amazing dot providers. <laughs> Love the analogy. So when it comes to kind of finding who to work with from the business side, and we will go a little bit more into the other side of this, of how freelancers can find those clients, mm -hmm. um, how can businesses kind of make sure they're looking at, at a diverse enough pool of, of freelance talent when they're looking to kind of expand those dots, basically, <laughs> or get those yeah. dots. So the recommendation that I would put forth and, and ask businesses to think of is start outcome first, don't start talent first. Um, so one of the questions that I really like to ask my clients uh, or prospects actually during sales calls is um, what problem were you facing that made you think that I might be the, good, uh, the right solution? Um, or more specifically, what problem were you facing that made you think content would be mm -hmm. the right solution yeah. because I'm a content freelancer? And that's a question I think people should ask themselves if they suddenly think, I have a lot to do. Maybe I should hire a freelancer. The next question should be, what problem are you facing or what outcome do you need to achieve that you think a freelancer is going to help you with? Because there are a lot of instances where the, that's correct and a freelancer will help you, but then sometimes not. And sometimes you need to buy a software. Sometimes you need to make a full-time hire. Sometimes you need to hire an agency instead of an individual. So start problem or outcome first. Um, problem you're trying to solve, outcome you're trying to achieve. Let's assume that that is a uh, uh, simple package scopable thing um yep. a new web design a blog post a research post is mm -hmm. like coding something whatever um, if you can create that scopable package then yes a freelancer might be a great thought um, then you treat it you can treat it almost like a recruiting process except you're not asking people to apply you're asking people to book a call with you and talk through and actually book a sales call because you're having a sales conversation not a, an employment conversation yep um i the ways that i've seen companies do it very widely you can sponsor freelance newsletters that that go out to certain types of freelancers um you can post it on your own social media if you have accounts. Um, Twitter is a pretty big platform for this. So getting the word out is really just a matter of um, talent sourcing. And it's thinking for anyone who is looking at me, where could they find me? And then on the flip side, think where do freelancers hang out? And that would be freelance newsletters, freelance communities. Uh, there are some freelance job boards and like LinkedIn, for instance, even has a note where you can tag if something is freelance. So 
it's it's a very standard process, but it only is effective if you know what you actually want, which is also the barometer, I think, for should you hire a freelancer? If anyone asks you that, my question is, what do you need done? And, the, and they say, oh, well, I'm not sure yet. Okay, don't hire a freelancer. At best, hire a consultant um, because you're just going to be so mad and the freelancer is going to be so mad and you know, it, you're going to get nowhere, which is another question I like to ask my, all of my prospects is, um, what do you need to achieve to feel justified in spending any money on this? And if they don't have a good answer for that, um, we have a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what sort of answers would you expect from, from a client or a prospect at that point? Like, we want to achieve this ROI, this kind of um, lead no. gen figure or like what it's, sort of it's actually far more practical it's um you know what what do you need to achieve okay this blog post has to exist right because <laughs> like, i've even had that level where i you know i've talked about business goals and they're like okay we're you know we're trying to appear as a thought leader we're trying to you know have high quality content our brand is very high quality so we need high quality content it's it's like the quality trap everything you do has to be high quality so when i say what do you what needs to happen they say it needs to be good and it needs to exist that's awesome now you might also get the uh you know we're looking for revenue growth but realistically you've got to dig more than that because i can't hand you revenue growth i'm only going to hand you the inputs um to your project. It's like my outcome is your input. So when you're saying revenue growth, do you mean revenue growth through content marketing? If so, do you mean that content is supposed to generate a call, a sale, a review? You know, you've got to suss that out a little. So there's got to be a bit more specific because obviously almost every business project has to result in <laughs> revenue at some point. Um, to some extent, or, or, you know, the, the closest thing to revenue. So it's not enough to just say those things. It's, it's what are you trying to actually achieve here? And I, as a freelancer, will often ask those secondary questions of, okay, growth. What, what is growth to you? And then, okay, now that we know what growth is, what is this? Like, what step is this in the project? Yeah. yeah. That's when we can actually start working on a real project scope because otherwise, I'll say, okay, I think you probably need a strategy kickstart and I can help you identify your problem. And for some people, that's perfect. But for others, they, they kind of aren't happy with the idea that someone has subtly pointed out that they don't know what they want. Um, and it can, it can cause tension. Um, but the problem is if I signed the contract, I would either be really, really frustrated or I'd have to just kind of mentally resign myself and kind of know that what I'm doing is not going to help them, but they've asked for it and they're paying me. So I'm going to do it. Mm. And I, I don't like taking those gigs. They don't feel good for me. And then I'm not helping my client, which is useless to them. They're wasting their money. But then it also harms my business in the future because when I go to get another client, they're going to say, well, what have you done for other clients? And I'll be like, well, they paid me. And <laughs> that's, that's not fun for anyone. So that's why I'm very strong on if you don't know what you want and you have the budget still, go hire a consultant. But otherwise, don't hire, don't ask for a freelance call unless you have a project in mind. It doesn't have to be perfectly scoped, but you've got to have a project in mind. The State of Work is brought to you by Lano, making it easy for businesses to hire and pay employees or freelancers in over 150 countries. For freelancers, Lano provides a free all-in-one platform to manage clients, track time and tasks, create invoices and get paid on time. Find out more at lano.io. Let's take a look into the freelancer side. Do, have you seen any um, like new or emerging tr um, trends in like sales and marketing for freelancers, particularly over the last couple of years where the whole world has changed and everyone's had that experience of working from home and, and companies are more, they've realized like you can trust people to work when they're not sitting right next to you. How do you think that that's changed the way freelancers can approach sales and marketing of their services? Oh, good question. 
And it's interesting because I actually don't think it has changed. I just think it has evolved. And I know that's a little bit of a cop out, but let me explain. So uh, the fundamentals of selling um, relationship based sales specifically is what I'm referring to, because as a freelancer, you're selling to another individual. Um, it haven't really changed. It's still focused on building rapport. It's still focused on scoping the project. It's still focused on um, the professionalism that you present. And what I like about this evolution is that each one of those things is getting a little more flexible. So we, you know, the, the freelancing world used to carry this stigma that you were just in between jobs. That is now lessening. And because of that, there is an opportunity to present yourself as a business owner, not just as an individual freelancer. That part's been great. We have this time flexibility element where a, a big thing about COVID specifically is people stopped caring about time zones as much. Uh, and, and, you know, you're catching up with your friend who lives across the country now, because once you're Zooming with your neighbor, what's the difference Zooming with your friend across the country? And that has manifested really interestingly for freelancers, because now you can start selling more internationally. Uh, because people are less afraid to look internationally. That, that's been great. So when I say evolution, I mean more flexibility, more opportunity, but the same fundamentals. And then that last piece of solving a problem before we had what I call the old way of freelance sales in the freelance sales blueprint, which is that the freelancer had to wait to be told what to do, uh, buy a client, buy a temp agency, something like that. And they were price takers. What's happened now is because we expect freelancers to be entrepreneurs in some regard, you are able to come forward as a freelancer and become a, a project scoper. You're allowed to ask what the client wants as opposed to waiting to be told what the client wants. You're allowed to challenge the client now because you're a partner with them. You're not waiting for the temp agency to assign you to something. And because of that, you can also become a bit more of a price maker and say, this is the value I provide. This is the outcome I deliver. And here's what I charge for that outcome. Now let's talk about if that makes sense for the value you are trying to achieve. So it's more choice, more evolution. It's, it's more of the same in different ways. Um, yep. Yep. But what I love is that it is giving freelancers way more freedom. But part of that is more responsibility. You have to be able to manage your own time. You have to be able to manage your own space. We all experience that working remotely can be amazingly productive, but also wildly distracting. So you have to know how to build your own environment. And you also have to show up. You have to mm-hmm. book that call. You have to run the agenda so that it's a comfortable, fun experience for someone remotely because they're not going to get any fun energy from you in person. You have to send your own contracts because not every company knows how to work with a freelancer. So you need to know how to work with every company. Uh, you have to send it with digital signatures because no one's going to print and fax things. You don't even have a fax machine. I almost guarantee no, no freelance listener of this podcast owns a fax machine. And it's all of those things that those are the underlying pieces that I focus on in my course, because it's easy for me to get on a podcast and say, yeah, you have to do it, but it's a lot more difficult to actually get it done. And that was why I built the course because it took me three years to build that ecosystem. And I put it all in this thing. And I was talking to one of the students in my course and she was like, Oh, it would have taken me three years to figure this out on my own and you just taught me in six weeks like that alone is worth the cost not to mention the new clients i've closed so Mm -hmm. it's all of that because the interesting thing is so many clients have told me this and i've noticed this with other freelancers as soon as you are one level more professional than other people you will close more deals so your best advantage uh, while you're working on your craft, while you're getting better at what you do for clients, is to get better at building the ecosystem around your business to make value delivery easier. And it would be a huge mistake to think that the sales experience is not part of the value delivery because you've got to start how you mean to go on. If you don't start acting like a partner who values a client, nothing's going to change when you close that client. And if they don't see that you value them from the first moment, they may not even want to work with you. That's yeah, super, super 
valuable advice there. Um, there's so much more I would want to ask you that we don't have time for today, Stefan. So I, I will wrap it up there, but I, I really want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, I am most active on Twitter at Stefan Palios. That's S-T-E-F-A-N-P-A-L-I-O-S. My DMs are open. So if you ever have questions, let me know. If you want to learn more about the course, it's freelancesalesblueprint.com. And my book is The 50 Laws of Freelancing, which is available on Amazon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. The State of Work is available wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram or Twitter by searching for The State of Work. For more information on anything we talked about in this episode, including links to Stefan's website, check out our show notes at podcast.lano.io. Thanks for listening and see you next time on The State of Work.